government sage advisor on COVID-19, who recently expressed worry about the timing and the speed of this great unlocking. He probably knows more than anybody else about the R rate and regional variation. I spoke to him just before we came on air, and I asked him whether the R rate of measuring the infectivity of the virus right now is going up. What's happened over the last um, month or two, or a couple of months, is the epidemic has shrunk right down. Uh, the lockdown has worked. So the large amount of community transmission that was occurring a couple of months ago has um, not complete, come to a complete stop, but has reduced enormously. Um, but then the epidemic has, has then been concentrated around the harder to control uh, parts, which are in hospitals and care homes in particular, so in closed settings. And because of that, it, the reproduction number, which reflects the overall um, average number of secondary cases each case generates, has, has crept up a bit. And that's crept up a bit because it's been uh, in, in those, those places where infection is spread very efficiently in hospitals and care homes. And because that's become a greater fraction of the total, then the overall reproduction number has gone up a bit. So the big question now is... Is that because the epidemic is continuing to shrink around those harder to, or those those settings where the where it's higher, where the reproduction number is tends to be a bit higher, or is it that the community transmission is going up a bit um, as well, or instead of? And at the moment, we don't really know the answer to that very well, unfortunately. Because Public Health England and the Cambridge University report thought that they said it's probably due to increasing mobility and mixing between households and in public and workplace settings. But you're not sure about that. I'm not sure about that. They actually have that kind of embedded in their model, that assumption, because they, they use the Google mobility data. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but, but that, uh, that has been going up. So mobility has been going up. But that doesn't necessarily mean that contact between individuals has been going up by anywhere near the same amount and we have been at the, at the school at the London school we've been doing we've been measuring people's contact behavior over the last uh, two months or so and that has crept up a titchy bit a, a very small amount but hasn't uh, hasn't returned to anywhere near uh, sort of pre-lockdown levels or anything like that now, in terms of the regional R numbers, the northwest, for instance, appears to be above 1, 1.1 1 .1 or thereabouts, and the southwest of England on 1. Um, again, how concerned should people be about that? Are these really significant statistical variations? So there's statistical variations. In fact, you've just been looking at one report. Um, the the SPI-M, which is the committee that, 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 that looks at this and comes up with the overall estimate of the reproduction number, takes evidence from now, I think it's 10 different mathematical models uh, and statistical models that are used and, and fit to data, and then combines all of those. And if you do that, then the other models, the other nine, so you've been looking at one, the, the PHE slash Cambridge one, um, the other nine aren't quite so gloomy. Um, I have to say, you know, the overall, it does look like the overall reproduction number is going up and going up a little bit, only very, very marginally, and perhaps a little bit in other in other settings. It is creeping close to one in some places. I think we can't rule that out that it might be even at around one in some regions. Um, but I, I, w I would stress that overall the assessment is it probably is still below one, probably everywhere you know, on average, you know, we know from the ONS survey that there are thousands of new infections every day in the community. So, um, you know, I, I, yeah. there's certainly not a time for complacency. You express some doubts about the speed of the unlocking, if I can put it that way, at a time when we thought, again, because of the ONS figures, the number of new infections per day were around 8,000 or north of that. They're now down to 5,000 and something. So perhaps the government's right to be unlocking at a roughly this rate. Well, it's, it's up to them, isn't it? It's, it's their choice. So they have to weigh these, these decisions up, you know, so they have to weigh the reduction in numbers of cases uh, against opening up the economy and so on. And, you know, they have to make that decision. I would still prefer to see the cases come down lower than they are at the moment. Um, you know, this is the, the ONS survey suggests that we're having around 5,000 new infections 
every day, and that's just in the community and just in England. That's ex excluding you know, Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland. That's excluding all of the infections occurring in hospitals and care homes, which are very significant numbers still. And so I would like to see the, the cases come further down. That's my own personal opinion. Um, uh, uh, but, you know, the government have to weigh these things up. Of course they do. Can I ask you, uh, as it were, a non-scientific question about public attitudes? Because I started the show by saying the country is still very divided between people who are really, really frightened of COVID-19 and have changed their behaviours quite a lot because of that, and those people who kind of think somehow it's all over. What would your advice be to somebody, you know, cogitating that? It's definitely not all over, unfortunately. There's an awful long way to go. Uh, if we relax, uh, then uh, this epidemic will come back very fast. So um, I think we do need to be really cautious. I actually think that, that people have been amazingly cautious and amazingly um, tolerant and, uh, to, uh, and adherent to the sort of guidance as much as possible. I really do. Um, and I think that people are still being very cautious, and thankfully they are. Uh, you know, as for, for, the, for the most part, because if we do relax our guard, this epidemic will come back very fast. So, again, with a sort of scientific eye on it, you'll have seen the big Black Lives Matter protests around Britain yesterday. Lots of people outside, many of them trying to socially distance as much as possible, but it's not entirely possible in those big uh, demonstrations. Do you think that that was a, a, a dangerous thing to do, or do you think it was relatively safe? Um... That's a tricky one, isn't it? So it looks like outside is, is much less risky than, than inside, so, um, so that's good. I think, I think maybe you have to bear in mind what the prevalence is. Uh, about one in a thousand people would be infectious. So that means that um, you know, if you have a crowd of a few thousand people, then you would expect some of those people to be infectious. And we know um, that, that infection can be passed on uh, from people who are who don't have symptoms, and so you know it is a risk mm. to have uh, mm. thousands of people congregating together. Um, the fact that it's outside that does reduce the risk. Um, many people were wearing masks. I, I saw when I saw some pictures on the news again, and that will reduce the risk somewhat. Um, but yes, of course, it does carry some risk, unfortunately. Mm. Um, week in, week out, I have politicians on the show trying to assess how we're doing as a country and I ask them about their regrets and their mistakes and what's gone right and what's wrong in a kind of grown-up way. Can I ask you, as a scientist advising these people, when you look back on this episode, whether you have some regrets about some of your advice or what you thought at the time? Yes, we should have gone into lockdown earlier. Um, I think it would, would have been hard uh, to do it. I think our... The, the data that we were dealing with in the early parts of March and our kind of situational awareness where uh, was really quite poor. Um, and so I think it was would have been very hard to pull the trigger at that point. Um, but I wish we had. Uh, I wish we had uh, gone into lockdown earlier. I think that has, uh, you know, cost a lot of, of lives, unfortunately. Uh, and you were widely quoted with what you'd said about herd immunity. Do you regret that? What I said about herd immunity was that that's how the epidemic eventually will end. And it will end via herd immunity. I, via vaccination is how we want it to be achieved, but that's how mm. all epidemics come to an end. So uh, we'll, we'll be under these restrictions in some way uh, until levels of immunity are such in the population that um, that we don't have to take these extra precautions to stop yeah. chains of transmission. Um, and so that will, um, you know, all mm. of us hope that that will happen via vaccination. Um, and there's, you know, increasing good news about the vaccination pro um, development programs. But um, it's the case. There is, mm. you know, there is... That's how it works. That's how all of the epidemics, that's how every epidemic works. That's not, yeah. there's nothing special about this one. That's how measles epidemics come to an end is because we ha achieve um, levels of immunity to stop that, to stop the level, I, to stop I, the measles outbreak. I suppose what alarms some people is the sheer extra numbers of people who would have to be infected with COVID-19 for us to achieve that. 
Oh, yeah. Tr I mean, uh, awful. I mean, that, and nobody ever wanted to, to achieve that. It was just a statement of this is how, this is how these things end. Um, it's not a matter mm. of uh, wanting it in any shape or form. That's really interesting. Professor Edmonds, thanks very much indeed for joining us this morning. You're welcome.